Okay, so we're going to start um, this right now. Um, hi, everyone. Um, hope you're all having a great weekend. This is Emmanuel, uh, the founder of the Gradient Boost. Gradient Boost is an online mentor guide data science school. Currently, we're, we're currently um, are running a four-month self-paced introduction data science course. This includes modules on Python, SQL, data viz, stats, linear algebra, machine learning. By signing up, you receive access to a learning portal, two tutorials from mentors or data scientists, and access to a weekly practical workshops, and a lot, a, a lot more. Our next class starts in uh, July. You can pre-register to on our site. Um, read, more, read more about us on our site at uh, theradiantboost.com. Um, um, okay, so send an email later on today with more information. So let's get started. Um, today we're having this informal chat with uh, Dale Seema. Dale is a data science specialist at FMD. This will be an interactive chat, so you're free to send through questions and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, so Dale, welcome, how are you? I'm great, how are you, Manuel? Thank you for having um, me. No problem, I'm, good. I'm doing great, thanks. Um, so tell us a bit more about yourself. Okay, um, I'm Dale Sam, I'm based in South Africa and Pretoria, I work for one of the top five banks in the country as a, as a data science, scientist specialist um, within the credit card space, broadening up to the fleet space as well. So that's what I do. Um, hey, well, currently, I'm currently also just a, a mentor in terms of um, providing mentorship programs for great learning, which is an online-based education, almost similar to gradient boosting. Where, we, where I tutor and mentor um, a lot of aspiring data scientists. Okay, um, so what was your journey to data science? Like how did you get into the field? Quite a very funny story actually. Um, it was never even in something that I thought of when I was in, in high school or even bust. So um, I, I personally studied actuarial science in, in my undergrad um, at one of the local universities. From there, I moved on to become a data analyst at Deloitte, where I was strictly focused on data management in terms of wrangling. Moved over there to become an actuarial analyst at um, FNB, and then I later moved on to another bank at, um, in South Africa as a strategic analyst. And that's when I actually developed the love of data science and trying to understand what data science was all about. Um, I, 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 I became then enrolled to the New York Data Science Academy, which is where I got my, the, which is where I got all my credentials and my qualifications. And I did so because as I remember as I was reading through one of the four magazines and they told me, well, there, there was an article stating that data science is one of the sexiest languages or sexiest careers of the 21st century. And um, I really wanted to be associated with sexiness, so that's when I decided I need to qualify myself as one. Cool. And what does your day look like? What do you do on a day to day basis at FMB? So strictly what, what, what I'm currently doing um, is focused on fraud. So we build machine learning programs that are going to detect fraud and we're talking early detection. Um, currently, some of the models that are, that, are, that are enabled, they're not for detecting early fraud. They mainly in terms of building rules around what sort of um, futures relate to a, a legit transaction. So I, I, I come in and I try and build a lot of um, supervised machine learning to, and, and, and a lot of forecasting to predict when a, tra a transaction is going to be fraudulent or not. So that consists of my day-to-day -day, um, at work. Um, as you can just imagine as a data scientist, you spend a lot of your day doing data cleaning up. Um, I think that is actually constituted about 80% of your total work. So you spend so much time doing a lot of that. Um, I come in every morning, leaving in the evening, trying to understand the, 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 the possible database relations and the data set that I'm going to require. So um, that, is, that is pretty much just my job to try and detect early fraud in, in, in transactions. Okay. So it sounds like a collaborative job. Um, how would you rate communication and soft skills for data science for your role in particular? How important are they? How would I relate how, that? Um, soft skills of communication, communicating with different teams. How would you like rate that skill? Yeah, um, and I think that is a very, it's a very good point you're raising. That is, um, the 
overall point of doing what we do is so that we can communicate the technical aspects of what we are learning to, to business. And failure, failure to do so will result in um, failure to do so will result in, in in your efforts being useless and and ineffective in business. So it is very important for you to try and get the soft side of the soft skills of your technical side. Um, that is one of the main things that one needs to understand about being a data science is not because you only want the tech to be technical but you also need to take the you need to take the solutions that you have built that you have developed and make sure that you translate them to business convince them to buy into your solution uh, maybe it's me i don't know convince them to buy into your solution oh, yeah, so I'll that myself. You know, your efforts will be will be will be valuable by them and you can solve a lot of um issues and what I have seen with most of my peers and some people of, that I know who are data scientists is that they struggle to find that bridge between, between technical and also soft skills. And it's very, very important that you try and, 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 and match the gap. And if you do understand what it is that you're doing on the technical side, you should find no issues in relating it or trans, um, translating that to business or anyone that is not very technical from the data perspective. Okay, so you can, you can I guess you can um, master the technical skills by practicing uh, on a regular basis. How would you go about improving communication skills as an aspiring data scientist? What would you recommend for someone who wants to get into data science? Okay, so um, just like what I did is I've attended a lot of online courses that um, translate that knowledge for me um actually i was i was i was also doing another course the previous week where it still teaches you how to communicate how to lend an impactful message to the next person so there's a there's a there's, there's a whole lot of online courses that one can take that are going to help you with that type of skill so that you are progressing or you are translating your information end to end from the technical side until they implement the solution gets implemented so it's, those those type of online platforms that are going to help you manage the bridge between technicality and also um, to your stakeholders. Okay. And for someone who is non-technical, doesn't have a computer science or actuarial science degree or a mathematical type degree, but they are very um, they want to get into data science. They're very driven. They're very inspired to get into the field. What would you recommend for them? Is a boot camp enough? Should they do more than that? What should they do exactly? What's the path to data science for them? Okay, well, data science is pretty much for everyone. Um, it's pretty much for everyone who is willing to learn to put in the work, to put in the effort. Um, of course, it will add value if you have the statistical background because that is the biggest foundation of machine learning. Not so much about the coding, the programming. That is 20% that is of what data science is about. If you're willing to put in the work, um, you will succeed. I've seen people that have that have studied um, human resources um, degrees and they went on to develop the love for data science. They did a lot of boot camps. Um, I'm, I'm, I myself included, I did a boot camp with the New York institution. The advantage that I had was um, my broad statistical background. So if you're willing to understand the statistical background, you will go far and this course is for everyone. That as long as you're just trying to put in the work and the, the, the effort. And I think what matters the most is also the passion that you should have. The passion, the love of what you do is going to take you places. And in this field, that is the ultimate um, skill to have. Do you find that building a portfolio that's, uh, I guess, data science oriented is helpful in getting your interview at least? Sorry, Manny, could you repeat that? Do you find that working on projects, like starting to build this data science portfolio, that's, is that a helpful path to go about um, getting into the, into, the, into the door, just getting an interview at least from a potential employer? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think, I think it also gives you um, a lot of practice when you do that to understand, um, to become a technical person and also to be knowledgeable in what you do. So that should give you um, and the, the edge of uh, uh, people who are not doing that. And it, 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 it is a valuable skill that you need to put on your, on, your, on your CV. So I think I do agree with that fact. Okay, so I'm sure when you're reading the Forbes, uh, that Forbes um, article regarding data science from the sexiest uh, job, you had some expectations about what, you, what the job would actually look like, what it would actually entail. 
Um, how did those expectations get to reality? Like, how's that? Uh, is there a disconnect? Is it the same thing you expected coming in? Was it different? To be honest, it's it's much more than what I bargained for. Um, I was, as, as I said initially, I started off as a data analyst, and you know, as a data analyst, all you're required to do is just to turn raw data into information that can be used for business. Mm -hmm. But with, with, with data science, it's more than just turning the raw data that you have. You can turn information into new information that can be used through multiple data sources like um, web scraping, for instance, is one of, uh, one of such. That is information that you can once again turn into raw data and into manipulation again. So what, what, I, have, what I have initially wanted to understand about data science was the, the statistical part of it, um, which was relating to risk modeling to be specific. Um, as someone that has an actuarial background, I was more focused on the risk modeling. But then once I, I got enrolled into, in, in the bootcamp course and I started practicing languages like Python and um, processes like natural language processing, um, I fell in love and I realized there's actually just so much that one can do with the data instead of just trying to build reports that you can send to your business. How about you come up with useful solutions, come up with... Um, come up with, with, with reports that are going to be valuable and more especially around predictive modeling. I think that is actually one another part that is more interesting about data science is the fact that you can predict what is going to happen in the coming future and you can only do that based on what you have today on, on, on your, in your databases. So it was quite a lot more than what I have bargained for when I joined. Cool. So the many the many roles in the data field. There's data science, there's data data engineering, there's um, data analysts. If you just mentioned just now, there's a BI analyst. How do you differentiate those different roles? Like, what's 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 the difference between a data engineer and a data scientist and a data analyst and a BI analyst? And how do you, I guess, how do you work yourself into one of those roles? Is it, is it a different path for each role? Is it the same thing, pretty much? Um. So data science is. It's a bit more broader than those careers that you have just mentioned now combined. So it touches a little bit more on, on, on everything. It touches a little bit more on data engineering in the sense that, excuse me, it touches a little bit more on the data engineering. Um, there's, there's packages and libraries like your PyTorch, which um, touches a bit more onto the data engineering side which relates to um, data structuring um, for the, I mean in terms of architecture there's also your BA understanding BA analyst which relates more to understanding the business itself which will eventually translate into it, I think I think that is actually the, the the transition that you will require from your technical to your soft side is if you have that BA skill which is a, also a requirement for data science you have that skill that is going to translate the data, um, the, the business requirements to the data requirements that you will be working with. And then there's also the data analyst part, which I have already touched on as, as, as my prior profession. Um, there's another one that you mentioned, BI. There's also BI, which is building intelligence around data. And a com like I said, a combination of all those four is, 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 is just a part of data science, but there's a whole lot more that goes into, into data science. Right. Okay. Does it does it matter what what language you actually like go about learning? So, for example, if you does it matter if you learn Python versus R, for example, to become a data scientist? Does that does that actually matter at all? <laughs> that's a that's a that's a, that's a very debatable question. <laughs> so, so um, I think I think it depends on 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 the scalability of what it is that you're trying to that you're trying to do. There are certain there are certain languages that are more scalable in terms of implementation. Um, than others. Um, it, I, I won't really specifically say that there's one language that is better than the other, but some people will tell you that Python is much more um, robust than, than, than your R, and some people will tell you that R is much more robust, or they will come up with another language. And for instance, I'm, I'm, very, I'm quite fluent in both in my R and Python, and just about a few weeks ago, I came across an article that was talking about um, the inefficiency of Python in machine learning coming um, in the next five to ten years and they started talking about a language called Julia and Julia is going to become one of the 
most commonly used language in machine learning um, in the next five to 10 years. So I think instead of trying to compare the two, how about you become versatile and try to learn all of them because they all serve different purposes at the end of the day. Mm, makes sense, makes sense. So how valuable is SQL for data scientists? You mentioned that the, the, biggest, the biggest work that you do is data cleaning. How valuable is SQL in, the, in that entire pipeline for your, your work? It's extremely valuable. Um, so I, I, on my day-to-day, -day, I, I, I use a combination of SQL and SAS for mainly data pooling um, through our uh, big data databases. Um, I use it for wrangling, for cleaning up and transformation. It's because I find it much easier to, to do the cleaning up in, in SQL or in SAS than you would in, in, in R. R, is, R and Python are more on the modeling side of things. So I will spend most of my time trying to make sure that my data is in the correct format, has the right dimensions, and I have done all the cleaning up and the transformation I can in SQL. Then I then later move on to the modeling part, which will be done in Python or in R. And you tend to spend a, lot, a little bit more time on, on the modeling part than on the cleaning up. Okay. So you mentioned a while ago, um, reading an article about the, the Julia language. So I'm guessing based on that, you read a lot just to, I guess, keep up with trends in emerging data science space. Um, so what use it as a podcast do you, do you read or on the resources in general, do you reach the trends in the industry? What do, you, what do you do to keep up to date with what's happening in the field? So um, I'm currently an active member of um, Towards Data Science where it's a platform you can blog and write articles about your experiences or the solutions that you come up with. I find it adds a lot of value as a data scientist for you to be going out there and looking for research because to be honest, we are in a very, we are in, 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 in a revolving world that, really, that, that goes towards the future every single day. And the only way for you to keep up is if you do your thorough research. So with sites like your, Towards data science, you find um, yourself on GitHub, um, Kaggle. Those are the sites that you will always keep you abreast with what is happening in the data science world. So um, being an active member, I, 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 I try to read at least two different articles every single day that are relating to um, my profession. And they could branch from multiple industries. Okay. And so someone coming to your science typically struggles with imposter syndrome, um, particularly if you're, if you're going through the self-learning or uh, bootcamp path. You may find yourself struggling with, um, I guess, whether you have the requisite skills to actually provide value in the company you're working with. I'm guessing it doesn't really matter what background you come from. Actually, have, everyone has that to some degree. How do you deal with that? Do you have that, that uh, issue at any point? The imposter syndrome, sorry, that is. Yeah. Well, not, not really, um, but I know people who have. Um, they, 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 come into, they come into the space and they, they get overwhelmed because they get overwhelmed because of the responsibilities of the, the results that they are producing. So you, it's, 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 it's kind of scary in the sense that you will come into the business and then you're going to build models. If your models, if your models are not accurate or if they, you think they're accurate and they yield results that are not best suited for the business um you have you have the you have the responsibility of making or sinking your business so it adds a lot of pressure but through practice you tend to build your confidence you tend to build that confidence so that you you you're able to interpret your results with um careful and the, imp uh, the the implementation will also be quite a good one so the imposter syndrome is applicable to quite a lot of people um but because I found myself quite comfortable with the data manipulation part before I even started the modeling, I knew that what I was putting into my models was actually a true reflection of what was sitting in the, in the databases. So coming into the field, do you find any value having a mentor? Do you have a mentor to begin with? Do you find any value having a mentor just as a beginner, I guess? Yeah, so when I started, I, 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 I didn't have a mentor, to be honest. Um, it was, like I said, I think, it was that curiosity factor that I had in myself to, 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 to empower me in becoming a data scientist. But I'll, however, I do find that the journey for me to becoming a data scientist could have come a little bit earlier than what I, what I, what I went through had I had a mentor. Um, I tried to go through all the hoops by myself. Um, 
But I think what I have seen with the people that I mentor, they're quite appreciative with the assistance that I am providing as a mentor. And because I'm able to take them through real life experiences that I have went through in my day to day, and they try to know which type of path to follow that I have paved for them. So it is quite instrumental to have to have a mentor, um, someone that has done um, what I mean, someone who has gone through what you what you want to go through. So it's 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 really 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 um, advisable from my side. Okay, different question. Um, what are the perks of being a data scientist at FMB? What do you enjoy most about working at FMB as a data scientist? Are there any perks that come with that that particular responsibility? Yeah. So um, banking as a whole gives me excitement. Um, because of the broad data that it has and as someone that it's ha- as someone that loves data there's just so much you can do with your with the data i mean r- recently there's inform there's data such as voice data that is being processed from voice to text and then eventually to information that can be used so i think for me more than any other industry banking is exciting for any data scientist and i'm not trying to be biased in what i'm saying Um, I know people that have been in in, in the life insurance space or the short-term insurance space or the medical space, but when you try and compare the the, the amount of data coming in um, from the banking side, you can just imagine on a single day, the amount of transactions that are flowing into into the database, you get close to 500,000 transactions on an an average bank. So it's quite a lot of data that you, you, you have and waking up every morning going to work, you get excited because you you just know that there's something that you're going to get into in, in, in the new overflow of the data to the database. Speaking of banking, are there any interesting trends emerging in the banking sector or I guess machine learning in the banking sector that you find it's intriguing that you're following just in the next in the near future, in the coming future? Yeah. So as I as I as I have mentioned that you'll find things like uh, I think voice data, it's um, something that is very under, under, underrated. There's, there's so much through what you and I communicate now. There's data that we, are, that we are sharing with one another in terms of voice. So you find um, things like call center agents. Um, they, they make many calls a day. Some calls relating to, to, to product solutions, some relating to channel solutions, some relating to customer queries. You find people calling in to stop their, their to block their debit orders. But what we have identified and what we have seen in, in the banking space is there's a lot of data that goes wasted in such that it doesn't get recorded. I mean, even when it does record it, but how do we then use that type of information? First step that you want to take in, in, in using that kind of data, you take it and you turn it to, you use a lot of, um, there's some softwares that one can use to translate, to translate it from text, I mean, to, from voice to text. And when you get it, when you have it in text, now that's just a matter of understanding natural language processing. And from there, you're able to to, to build models or to build solutions that are going to be used. For instance, um, I can can give you one example of around debit orders where a certain customers would always call in and they would complain about one type of debit order that they, they did not sign up for, right? So, and there's also trends that, and there's trends and patterns that we build from data. When you find around a certain time, time of the month, um, at, on, on a certain time, on a certain day, you find people calling in. And then you can link that specific user ID, which is the telephone number that making, that's making the phone call. And you're able to predict what this person is going to be um, talking about. And instead of you transferring them to a call center agent, which they might end up holding on for 15 to 20 minutes, because all lines are busy, you, how about you, you, you personalize their conversation with, with a machine that is going to solve the problem in less than 15 seconds. So you can build natural language processing modeling um, that are going to classify such type of um, callers and you can make it an easy transaction, an easy conversation without frustrating your, your, your customers. So you mentioned uh, NLP uh, trends, supervised learning, supervised learning. How would you explain those terms to someone who is not technical, is a layman basically, but wants to learn data science? How would you explain those um, terms to them? Okay, basically 
natural language processing is um it's a computer language that is there to mimic your human mind so what it does it almost takes what's in your mind as long as you're able to put it in writing you put it in in in, in a text format whether you're typing it or you're writing a piece of note so the computer is going to take whatever it is that you're typing it's mainly used in your social media to sort of analyze your social media it's able to take to to take your thoughts and you well, your thoughts in terms of writing and able to summarize that information and could make a conclusion about the end result of what the text is relating to um not sure if you can allow me to give an example of something that I'm currently working on that relates yeah, to text. If you can, if you can. Okay, thanks. So, um, I was sitting, I, I was sitting, and I was sitting down just before um, lockdown, and well, it was just in the early stages of the whole COVID nineteen, and we we're talking. I was listening. I was listening to the news, and they were talking about depression and how a lot of people are. Uh, going are uh, going through depression they are going through anxiety about COVID-19 they don't know what's going to happen to them in the future I mean, in the next by the future I mean the next seven days the next 14 days they don't know what is going to happen so I started doing a lot of research on understanding on and you see all of this information on social media people panicking they don't know what is going on but what you what 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 you what we're not aware is all of that information we can sort of build a solution for such people that are going through such. And as a result, um, there's, um, there's a project I'm working on that is dealing with mental illness and you're able to gather information on platforms like your Facebook, like your Twitter, that are relating to COVID-19. And by that, I mean, you can tell that it's relating to COVID-19 based on sick things like your hashtags. They can tell you that this post, um, um, person X posted about COVID-19 and then you will then collect that type of information. You're able to tell if it's a positive or it's a negative comment or a, more, a negative um, text. And once you've done that, if you find that it's a negative text, you then go further, you apply what we call neural networks to identify if it's related to a mental disorder. If it is related to a mental disorder, then there's more, there's a further step that you take what type of mental disorder is it? Is it, is it um, depression? Is it PSTD? Is it anxiety? Is it bipolar? And then once you're able to get to that level of information, and you're all doing that based on nothing but text, and um, by linking those texts to the username of the tweet. And once you're able to do that, the whole purpose of doing this is so that you can detect early depression in people and send those leads to medical professionals. What we, the reason for doing so is um, as much as medical pr practitioners um, are offering support or your counselors are offering support to depressed individuals, they tend to pick it up a bit late when the depression is so severe, someone has turned into alcohol, they have turned into um, substance abuse, whereas all that information could be sitting somewhere in social media and we could have used it to prevent all the, 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 the severity of that type of mental disorder and that is where nlp or data science comes in um, in the form of words you use that you use that type of data to sort of save lives by early detection and once we have identified that someone has symptoms of being um, depressed then you recommend them to um, a doctor so that is that, that I, I thought i should just say, um, share something like that because Data can be applied in every environment. It could be applied in, in construction anyway. Okay, so you mentioned neural networks just, um, in your uh, previous answer. How would you um, explain what neural nets are to someone who like, has no context, I guess, uh, about what neural nets are in general? Okay. Well, neural networks is, <laughs> I think it's pretty much like uh, multiple nested if statements. <laughs> So it tests for a lot of possibilities. Um, it looks at relationship between variables and their observations. It's almost like how your brain works. Your brain is made up of um, neural networks that send certain sensations to different parts of your body. So in doing so, a neural network, it's one of the, 
it's 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 one of the the, the supervised machine learning that we we, we have in, in 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 data science. It it uses a breakdown of different nodes um, that you create from your data, and it's able to build different possibilities and comes up with one outcome. So it's going to eventually build a path that you used from your output from your input all the way up until whatever happens in the middle and um, it gives you an output. So that output will be a trace that you use to get to your output. So that is what neural networks do. It's going to give you a lot of, um, it gives you a lot of nodes that, um, that, you, that, that you can use to, to give um, a certain sort of prediction. So you mentioned that people are struggling with, uh, with anxiety and I guess fear of I guess what's happening and what would happen in the future, in the near future, regarding this COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns. Um, people are losing their jobs, they're losing their, their livelihoods pretty much. Do you think this will have an impact on the demand for data scientists or it's actually going to increase the, the demand? What's, what's the impact going to be in your, in your opinion? So um, with, with COVID-19 coming into place, we see, we see a lot of um, digital um, platforms growing. We see uh, the need for people to, to work on their machines than they would normally on, on applying physical labor. So, and there's also studies that are shown that in the near future, um, by near future, I'm talking anything in the next two years, there's going to be a lot of demand in the IT profession and data science and big data coming as, 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 as the biggest um, careers or skills that are going to be required in the future. So by doing so, by trying to, um, to gather the skills from those two different professions, but there's, there's a whole lot more professions um, than data science, that, but they're more, they, they mainly relate to the IT industry. So specifically to the data science, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of demand for um, data scientists or machine learning experts out there. Okay. People often use the term AI in the change of view with machine learning. Um, how do you differentiate the two? Like, uh, is AI, is machine learning a subset of AI? What's, what's the difference in the two terms? Well, AI requires machine learning to operate. That's, 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 that's number one. Uh, machine learning is, it's, 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 it's applicable to, well, it's applicable to AI. It's applicable to IoT, which is your internet of things. It's applicable to a lot of, things like your drones as well. So a lot of a lot of technologies requires machine learning and that is just the study of understanding how future predictions are going to be or future classifications are going to be. Um, I'm trying to think of an example which um, I'm, str I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think of one but now the, 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 the whole driver of artificial intelligence is um, where well, lies under machine learning. And machine learning is quite broad. You've got um, things like your unsupervised and your supervised machine learning, which, are, which both serve different purposes. But um, through training your, old, um, your existing data, you will then be able to apply that um, data or that trained model to your test, which will become any form of new data that comes into your database or could be coming into whatever machine that you are trying to learn. And that is pretty much the driving factor of your artificial intelligence. It's through machine learning. Okay. And are there any trends in the broader AI space that you, are, that you find fascinating? That you're following, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So as I said earlier on that, I do a lot of research and you come into, you come into contact with um, interesting projects that people are running. Um, one particular one is the usage of, 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 of drones to perform duties that are typically performed by professions like your quantity surveys, um, your town regional plannings. So mainly drones in the, in the construction space. What, 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 what a lot of companies are doing now is instead of sending you as an individual to a site where you're going to take measurements of, of, of land and trying to analyze what is contained in that land and how that can that land be split into different parts where, say, for instance, in the, um, in the case of a town regional planning, which areas would be suited for, um, for corporate, uh, would be suited for, for human residents and things like that. 
people are now using drones to identify those type of um, locations. You take your drone, your drone will obviously be already implemented with um, machine learning models in itself. Some of those machines will be flew up in the air and takes pictures of that empty land. And then from there, there will be, depending on the particles of that particular area, it's going to give you um, your different usages for that particular land. It can sometimes it goes as far as identifying if there are any minerals underground on that land, and if there are any minerals, what type of minerals are actually underlying that particular piece of land. So there's a lot of uses for for for, for machine learning and data science as a whole in the future. Okay. So going back to the learner who is uh, intrigued, who wants to become a data scientist and is learning on his own or herself, um, what would you recommend they do to pick their first project to they showcase their skills, or learn new skills? Someone who is, who is um, self-learning to become a data scientist. Either self-learning or just recently graduated or becoming a data scientist, like any background pretty much. Okay, so like I said, the first things that you would want to do to, to, is to, to equip yourself with, with, with a lot of knowledge in statistics. You, once, once, once you have gotten that, you then, then um, try to understand which language you might want to be comfortable with in, in understanding your, the scalability of what you're trying to solve for. And eventually after doing that, there's always small problems that you can always learn, um, try to solve by yourself. You can come up with small things like, um, there's a whole, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of um, my, pre my, my, my first project, but it was, it was, it was actually work related. But for those that don't want to be doing some work related or they don't have work issues that they might want to use machine learning or data science to solve them, there's platforms like your GitHub, like I said, um, your Kaggle, which will pick up, um, you can pick up a problem from there that will, that will um, um, require you to solve. And then from then, you will still have people that you can ask for help in terms of solving that particular problem, you have solutions that you can work towards on. So it's really, really up to you. There's a whole lot of platforms that are sitting out there. There's a whole lot of data science communities that you can consult with and all of them are there to, to assist you. Okay, so assuming you're, you're a recent agent who is interested in machine learning, does the context you have in real estate, is that, is that helpful in guiding the project you build first? Would that be an advantage if you build something that's uh, you can be completely understanding of the first project? Sorry, repeat that. So I guess how important is context? For example, if you if you work in real estate and you have the context, the real estate context, you understand the the sector very very well. Is it is it worthwhile building a project that is I guess that you have more context regarding? Is that is that helpful at all? It is. It is. It is I think it is helpful. Um, I think I think the the, the 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 knowledge that you would have in that particular field um, would be an addition to something like um, building, um, including uh, making data driven decisions. Um, by that, I mean as a as a real estate agent, sometimes you think you might you you might think what the price for a particular price would I mean for a particular residence would be, but based on um, what the market is sitting out there, but then. Once you once you once you have a collection of data that relating to the the the, um, the housing or the real estate agency, once you have a whole lot of um, data around that, you can apply it and make sure that you make data driven decisions that are very scientific. First of all, they are extremely scientific, and once you've got your scientific translation to to problems, it's 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 very it's very difficult for anyone to come and um, fault your results or it's very difficult to, to make an error in, in, in whatever it is that you're working out for. So having, an, having knowledge in that particular industry would be an um, added benefit, but then you still need to somehow try and make, uh, make sure of the, um, that you apply the scientific cases or solutions. Okay. So we often hear how uh, feature engineering is the most, apparently one of the most important ways to, I guess, uh, uh, improve your model's performance. Um, how valuable would be the context you have with the same example we just mentioned when it comes to the feature engineering part of the machine learning process? Is there value in that part of the, the pipeline? 
um, um, future engineering um, adds a lot of value. Um, find it uh, find it extremely useful when you doing things like um, 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 linear regression, for instance, um, where you are ably way way where you are sort of predicting for a a um, the price of something. In, in this instance, let's assume you you might in, you're in the real estate agency and you're trying to predict the, the the price of a particular house in the future. And future engineering is going to make or break your machine. You what you want to do is there's going to be a lot of factors that are going to participate or that are going to be involved in your model. And you need to make sure that there's not much variation in your observations that you have and the, 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 the particular related variables. So you might want to do a lot of um, future engineering. And it's, a, it's, it's not a very easy concept to grasp at first. Um, and it can be improved through experience by trying to understand what are the particular, uh, what are the different ways that I can apply my uh, future engineering. But as long as you make sure that it is applied in order to, to, to reduce your variation. Because at the end of the day, in building your model, you are trying to reduce risk. And how we measure risk in, 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 in machine learning is through um, the, the, the variance that you might have in, in your data. And future engineering is there to mitigate that type of variation that you might have. So it's, and it's, an, it's an important case to go through. Speaking of model building, um, for a, someone who's new to data science or trying to do data science, it is probably very difficult figuring out which, which um, this machine learning algorithm to use to solve a particular problem. Is there a process that you recommend to a beginner to, to try and maybe figure out which, which model is for which type of problem? Or is it just like a very uh, case-based in terms of experience? <laughs> try all of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so obviously, obviously there's, um, there's a starting point to everything. Um, I, think, I think the important thing is trying to understand the data set that you're working with. There's different models that can be applied to um, things like your categorical variables only. There's models that can be applied to continuous variables only. There's models that can be applied to a combination of both. And I think the first step that you might want to take is whether you're going to apply supervised or unsupervised machine learning. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Am I trying to predict for something that's, that's existing? Am I trying to predict for something that I have no idea of, um, which in the case, if you really don't know what it is that you're predicting for, but you are hoping that you will see some form of a pattern you apply, things like your clustering, you apply things like your market basket analysis, which are going to give you information that you never even knew about. But if you've got a specific ask in mind, there's, there's um, models that are supervised. And even then, you need to understand whether you're performing a um, regression uh, modeling or you're performing classification. And there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of um, decision that you need to get to before you get to the type of modeling you go in, into. Um, but I think the starting point is understand your data set first and understand the variables associated with it. Then that will determine what sort of modeling that you can use. And even then, in the, multi, in the many um, machine learnings that we have, like your um, random forest, you've got your support vector machines, you, all of those, they also have their own specific assumptions that can be applied but then your data set will tell you if those if any of those assumptions will hold for you to be able to apply that mod and um eventually if you find that maybe you can apply five please as many as many as you can apply them as long as you make sure that your assumptions are met and then you can do your model performance at the end to see which one has performed accurately um for the type of question you are asking so we often hear people saying that you should use, a, I guess, a baseline model to start off with, a very simple model, and then, I guess, build another more complex model after, after first seeing the results of the simple model that you build. Is there any value, like, uh, going the course of, of going from the simplest model to putting the most complex model? Is there any value in doing things that way? Yeah, um, I think, I think um, for starters, for people that might not have an idea of how to apply the, the um, how to apply machine learning in general, I think basic modeling would 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 actually go in a long way before you start doing your um, assembling models. Um, 
let's things like your decision tree. It's quite easy to 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 understand for you um, as a as a in, as a as a beginner. You will then be able to uh, interpret the result before you can start building onto it. Before you build things like your um, gradient boosting, which are all family of your decision tree, which is the simplest form that one can apply. So your baseline modeling will 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 will, will give you um, a broader understanding of what it is that you are predicting. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the guests, by the way? If you, if you want to ask any questions, type it up on, on the messages if you have any question. Okay. Um, we'll just wait for any question to come up in the next, I guess, 15 minutes. If there's nothing, then we'll just like, ask a few last few questions. Um, so I guess as a, the, the last few questions, what advice would you give to just the uh, people learning data science in general? Like what, what tips would you give to them to accelerate their, their learning process? Okay, so the tips that I would give is um, be curious. Um, when you're curious, you are able to answer, you're, you're able to ask a lot of questions. And uh, if you are someone like myself who doesn't do well, if I don't have a solution to something, I, 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 it, it really frustrates me. So when you've got a lot of questions, you tend to do a lot of research. And research is going to give you a lot of ideas on how to, 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 to upskill yourself into something that you want to upskill yourself in. Like, uh, like I said the other day, I was just sitting and watching the news and an idea came up and I said, I need to try and understand how I can apply, um, how I can detect depression in, in, in um, NLP. And that's when I went over um, 300 pages of research in, in, in two days. And from then, I was able to know what it is that I need to do, what sort of connections and dots I need to connect. So curiosity and research really, really, really plays a lot in, in the life of a data scientist. We are in a very fast-paced career um, where things are growing exponentially. Today, today's data um, might not be nothing compared to in two months. In two months data, we're probably going to have so much data that is unaccounted for. And it's mostly in the form of unstructured data. And let's, let's um, try to understand how to differentiate between the two and how to treat your type of your structured data and your unstructured data. And eventually, as we have initially um, discussed, how am I going to bridge this gap? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And how am I going to give this information to the next person who is not as technical as I am? Try to close that bridge um, between technicality and also soft skills. Okay. And for the learner who wants to I guess, get a mentor on their own, or how, would you, how would they go about reaching out to data scientists to try and find a, a mentor to guide them through their, through their learning? Okay. Um, there's, um, there's, a, there's, there's a few platforms that one can use. Um, one of them, which is easily um, your LinkedIn, could be one of them, where you engage with people in, in, in similar careers. Um, could be people at work that can mentor you as well. So find someone that is in that field that you, can, um, that you, that you know you're comfortable talking to that person and you know that they're going to give you proper advice. Alternatively, you, there's, there's, there's platforms like your, 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 this one that we are on now, your um, gradient boosting platform, which um, I think is a very good initiative to try and upskill people and channel them in the right direction to where they should be moving and what they need to focus on in becoming um, successful data scientists. So there's, um, there's quite a lot of platforms today um, on, on, on the internet that one can go through. We have a question. Um... So, you spoke about big data. Um, is the relationship between big data and AI as it is with ML? Sorry, the issue with? Um, so, let me just try and read the question again. Uh, okay. You spoke about big data. Um, is there a relationship between big data and AI as it is with machine learning? So the question is, um, what's the difference between big data and, and, and AI, if I'm not mistaken? Or what's the relationship between well, big data and AI? Well, big data is pretty much just um, 
it's pretty it's pretty much just data that comes in 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 large volume there's not really um you can't really compare the two but you what you can do is you can apply your machine learning to your big data which will which is much more efficient than i think i think i think the the question possibly would have been in terms of the types of industries that you might have there's certain industries that might not even give you d big data um I think big data will just be around the, the, the volumes that are coming in. Not too sure if the question is very clear in this in this case what what it could be. Can we perhaps have the person speak into the question? Let's try and uh, unmute. Unmute, uh, Ritmore. Hello, do you mind asking a question again, please? Okay. Um, maybe the question is the relationship between big data and, and artificial intelligence. I guess maybe it's how is big data used yeah. in AI, maybe? Okay. No, well, it's, 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 it's around scalability. Um, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I can try to answer the question, to my best ability um, around scalability, there's certain types of there's, a, there's certain types of tools that cannot handle big data, um, and then there's tools that can handle big data, like your Python, for instance, and um, which is where things like your data engineering comes into place. How are you going to structure that big data um, that is going to be flowing from um, um, the whatever sources or systems that you're using? And how are you going to then apply that big data to produce information to your solutions? So I think I think big data is just a tool that is used in in in, in machine learning or in AI. Cool. Another question is how useful is domain knowledge in the real life, um, and which sectors appear to be more relevant within financial institutions such as uh, FNB? So domain knowledge is quite useful. Um, I think we've also clarified it um, with the re, um, estate agency example. It's very important for you to be knowledgeable in, in the industry that you're in. But we find ourselves as data analysts, uh, data scientists, that most of the things, um, well, I personally come from, I started my career in, um, in a consulting environment where you're exposed to a lot of um, industries. Um, I went into the mining industry. I had no idea what mining was about. Sometimes the data will speak for you. The data, you don't necessarily have to have that full knowledge or understanding of, um, of the broader industry. But once you've got that data and you do your profiling very well, you do what we call um, exploratory data analysis. It will help you understand um, what sort of issues you're working with, especially in the data set. But it's not really a priority or a must for you to be an expert in, in, in that domain that you're working in. If you do have that information, it is much easier because then I think it will also close that, it will bridge the gap between your technical side and also interpreting what you found out or what you have discovered to, to, to your stakeholders. So it's, it's advantageous, it's not a, a must. Um, another question we have is, uh, what responsibilities do data scientists have in the banking industry? Um, in terms of managing the data, how free are you with the data? Um, we, you, you are not as free, especially in the banking industry. We, 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 we work a lot with sensitive data. We work a lot with um, client data. So you need to be sure that whatever it is that you are working on is going to be useful because what you don't want is to um, access a client's account and eventually do nothing with that information. Um, so what you want to, what, what, what you would want to do is to make sure that um, you've got your, your, your ducks in a row when you're going to solve that um, particular information. There's, there's, not, there's not much free time, to be honest, um, when you are dealing with data, um, especially around now in lockdown, there's so much work that one is, is, is doing. There's many problems that arise within the business. Remember, as a data scientist, we are servicing business. We are solving business problems. And within the banking industry, there's many sectors. There's things like your, there's things like your banking operations. There's things like your transactional space. There's things like your fraud space that are very, very 
data demanding and there's hardly no time for you to, to, to sit around and not do much, but there's so much data to be consumed in the banking space. Another question we have is, uh, is it possible to create your own enterprise if you're a data scientist? Is it possible to create your own enterprise if you're a data scientist? It's more like um, going the entrepreneur route. Is, it, is there any avenue for someone who's more entrepreneurial to build something as a data scientist? Yeah. Um, if you've got the skills, it's very easy. Um, if you've got the skills, remember data science, is, it's, it's still considered a rare skill. So when it's considered a rare skill, meaning that not a lot of people can apply that skill. So what you can do is you can, you, you, you can first fill yourself with the um, data science capabilities and how you can start building your own brand as a data scientist is, is through contracting with um, small enterprises, small um, emerging businesses that are data driven or technology, uh, technology driven ones. Like I started, I started on the side with um, consulting for a lot of smaller companies and you build a brand for yourself as you go on and to becoming an entrepreneur. So there's a lot of opportunities for one. And this is a, this is a business that I'm, I don't see running out of, um, running out of um, the market anytime soon. So it's still going to be exponential. Just make sure that you've got the right skills and you are reliable. The question here is, um, data science space is booming. Um, something in the industry, how's the job market looking? Are there chances of oversaturation and would you encourage people to pursue uh, a career in the data science space? So it is booming. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, not to show which, which, which geographical location you might be in, but then there's countries like, um, countries like India. They, they have multiple, multiple of data scientists. Um, but then you see countries like your, your USA, they, 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 they do have data scientists. Um, Emmanuel, correct me if I'm wrong here. I might be speaking out of no, right. they do have a lot of They do have a lot of opportunities, but the market is not so saturated for um, people like your data scientists. So it is booming. And another thing, another thing about the career itself is, as I said, you can be self-employed by solving businesses. You know, I mean, solving solutions, building models that can um, be useful in the, in, in the economy uh, or the community that you might live in. So there's really not saying that um, you can't find um, a job as a data scientist. I think it's more around, um, it's more or less like your web developers, um, ap application developers. This, the market is very, very open for um, such skills. Okay. As a final question, um, it's a bit more for, I guess, a different question from others you've asked so far. What's your most controversial opinion about data science? Um, what you want to share with us? Um, it's the fact that um, we are trying to take people's jobs by creating machines. So I think I think that's a very it's a it's a it's a misconception about the the, the career or profession itself. Um, it is data science, machine learning is there to simplify the the problems that we are incurring in our communities. But people, the minute they start hearing things like, ah, oh, there's a machine coming in, I'm, not, I'm going to lose my job to a machine. Um, I, got, I, got, I got that kind of feedback when I was trying to get professional help from one of my psychologist friends as I was building this um, depression um, early detection model. And um, she said to me that, um, tell me once your model is done so that I can start saving up for my career. And I said, no, the whole purpose of me doing this is to make the job easier for you and make it a bit more optimized. So there's a misconception about data science as a, a tool that is going to take a lot of jobs from people. It's not entirely true. Yeah, but the last question from our guest is, um, you mentioned Cattle is one of the platforms one can use, I guess, to learn. Um, so how does one stop themselves from chasing accuracy or a high Kaggle score instead of building proper statistical models? Okay, let me, um, sorry, I'm just trying to read it. <laughs> um, so chasing accuracy. <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing because I know this person. <laughs> <laughs> so um, chasing accuracy, I think it's, 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 it's another thing that we should consider in, in machine learning when you are working in machine learning is it's not everything. Accuracy in your model does not define how well your model is predicting. There's a lot of um, 
mo uh, model performance measures that one can look at. For instance, there's issues where your accuracy will not count that much, but things like your sensitivity or your specificity of your model is going to be very, very, very instrumental. Um, especially when you've got your highly imbalanced data. When you've got your highly imbalanced data, your accuracy will count for nothing. Um, so it's understand your problem, understand the model that you're applying, um, see what type of model measures you want to look at. Things like your confusion matrix are quite useful in your, in your um, classification part of your machine learning. So accuracy is important, but there's other aspects that one should, needs to look at. Okay. So don't, don't um, go around checking that, those type of measures. Okay, I think um, we don't have any questions coming in from our guests and it, is, it has been an hour. So thank you so much for your time, Dale. Um, really appreciate the time you spent with us and all the conversation you just had, the entire conversation you just had. And yeah, thank you. Enjoy thank you for having me, Manuel. Um, and thanks for everyone for attending and all the best within your respective careers. Awesome. Cheers, everyone. Okay. Cheers.